Hello, everybody, and welcome to this next edition of our virtual talks with Benjamin Franklin House. Uh, today, I am very delighted to introduce Professor Amy Rebell, uh, and she is going to talk to us about what would Benjamin Franklin think of Facebook. This is part of our annual Fulbright lecture series in collaboration with the US-UK Fulbright Commission. And on that, I will pass it over to Amy. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, and thank you to the Benjamin Franklin House and also to Rebecca Thurston at the US-UK Fulbright Commission and everyone there. Um, this is a great honor for me and a nice tradition to continue come rain, shine, or pandemic. Uh, thank you also to everyone working outside their homes and especially in caring for our health so that those of us fortunate to be at home can continue to research, write, and learn together. Each day, Facebook users send and receive billions of photographs, animations, videos, articles, useful and useless information, gossip, advertisements, fundraisers, and political and social screeds. This massive information reaches so-called friends, friends of friends, and so on to the reaches of the globe. There are also groups to join, promotional opportunities, and overwhelming array of response to all of this. Emojis, witty banter, supportive cheers, and acrimonious vitriol freely flow, enabling ideas, opinions, news, facts, and outright lies to bind people together in what Facebook likes to tout as a community. <clears throat> this all may sound fundamentally disassociated from an era in which news publishing required setting type by hand and then delivery by boat or horse or both. However, many aspects of Facebook would be thoroughly recognizable to Benjamin Franklin, America's first master of social networking. As a writer, printer, publisher, and postmaster, Franklin was the most experienced and thoughtful intellectual of his era <clears throat> who pondered and defended the theory and practice of communication. It seems worthwhile in our perplexing times to try and invoke his wisdom by engaging in a thought experiment. What would Benjamin Franklin think of Facebook? First, we will consider the aspects he likely would admire, and then dive into some of the many elements of Facebook that Franklin might well have viewed as problematic given his own experiences and beliefs. Looking back to Facebook's origin story, Franklin undoubtedly would be impressed, but also annoyed that it emerged from the hallowed halls of Harvard. As a boy, Franklin grew up in Boston and thought of Harvard College as a bastion of spoiled elitists taught by sanctimonious and censorious Puritan clergymen. As the son of a candle and soap maker, Franklin was able to access only two years of formal education, and so likely harbored jealousy of the rich young gentleman on the other side of the Charles River. His own instruction was a much more organic affair. At the age of 12, Franklin's father contracted for him to be an apprentice in his brother James's printing shop. Frustrated at doing only menial work, Franklin began submitting articles for publication under the pseudonym Mrs. Silence Dugood. His fourth essay ridiculed Harvard College. The students of this famed place, he wrote, were little better than dunces and blockheads, and after graduation are as great blockheads as ever, only more proud and self-conceited. I just want to take a moment, Caitlin, I can still see you. Um, so is that being broadcast to everyone? No, so they can't see me at the moment. All right. Sorry, because in my window, your face is over Mark Zuckerberg's face, but okay, I got it. <laughs> Never mind. Um, sorry, thank you. Uh, notwithstanding his feelings about Harvard, Franklin most certainly would have admired the hard work, innovation, and enormous profit launched by Mark Zuckerberg and a handful of his classmates from a dorm room in Cambridge in 2004. He might even have seen Zuckerberg as a kindred spirit. Each of them chose a rebellious and entrepreneurial path at an early age. At 16, Franklin ran away from Boston, illegally breaking his contract with his brother and risking arrest to strike out on his own. Zuckerberg, likewise, nearly was expelled from Harvard before he dropped out following his sophomore year. To create an obnoxious website called FaceMash, Zuckerberg, at the age of 19, hacked into the Harvard University network and it extracted photos of his female classmates for the purposes of constructing a game which asked users to compare the headshots and select who's hotter. Franklin might have seen this as ungentlemanly, but he also would have appreciated the fraternal sexism. In 1745, he penned advice to a young man on the choice of a mistress, urging marriage, but counseling that if the young man preferred to initiate an affair, he should choose an older woman on the basis that she would be smarter, kinder, more useful, discreet, and grateful. Franklin clearly would have recognized, if not shared Zuckerberg's sexist mischievousness, but even more significantly, he would have entirely grasped 
what Zuckerberg was trying to accomplish in the coming years as he strove to develop Facebook into something entirely different than its immature and mean-spirited initial version. In its early years of public development before 2008, Facebook focused its efforts on developing a news feed through which groups of friends shared information and ideas about, quote, the things they were passionate about. After creating an account, users added friends to their feed, thereby forming what has become known as the world's first digital social network. Franklin would have understood and cheered this objective wholeheartedly. After training as a printer in London in 1725 and 1726, Franklin settled in Philadelphia. His first serial publication beginning in 1729 was the Pennsylvania Gazette, the most substantial newspaper in colonial America, which provided news from both home and abroad, reports of public events and scientific discoveries, as well as editorial essays and letters. An example of its cohesive aspiration is Join or Die, the first political cartoon printed in North America, which in 1754 advocated that colonial militias fight together for their common defense in the French and Indian War. Franklin's most famous and nearly ubiquitous colonial publication, Poor Richard's Almanac, similarly provided a communal wellspring of information that united colonists. Franklin also organized a society of mutual improvement with several men he admired in Philadelphia, known as the Junto, which eventually became a model for many others in the city and beyond. Initially, members brought their own meager book collections to share, but Franklin was a voracious reader. In 1731, he encouraged 50 people to contribute funds to purchase and import books and to share them. The Library Company of Philadelphia, which is still flourishing today, thus became the first circulating library in the colonies and eventually the first Library of Congress. All of these efforts achieved similar goals to Zuckerberg's idea for a newsfeed, sharing information that connected individuals together in conversation and strengthened their ability to perceive of themselves as a community and to organize as one. Another aspect of Facebook Franklin would have loved is the speed at which the information flows from one person to another. It was a much different story in Franklin's day. Disseminating information involved the labor intensive work of setting the type for each page of text and then literally pressing paper onto the inked type to print each sheet. Then printers had to arrange circulation of their finished product. Sharp elbows often were involved in this effort and both Zuckerberg and Franklin used them in establishing their businesses early on. When Franklin and Hugh Meredith bought the Pennsylvania Gazette from Samuel Keimer in 1729, Andrew Bradford was the town postmaster which meant that all the information traveling through Philadelphia went through his shop, an enormous economic advantage. Additionally, postmasters enjoyed franking privileges, meaning that Bradford's newspaper, the American Weekly Mercury, could cir circulate for free. Using his political connections, Franklin managed to get himself appointed postmaster of Philadelphia in 1737, after which time his gazette vastly expanded its reach. Franklin spent the next 53 years of his life serving as a postmaster, first for Philadelphia, then for the colonies as a whole, and finally as the first postmaster general of the United States. During these decades, he ended the practice of giving financial perks to some newspapers and printers over others, thus facilitating a tremendous increase in the information that flowed throughout the colonies. His efforts also contributed to lowered costs, extended post roads, improved coordination and frequency of mail carrier routes, and improved mail privacy, all of which facilitated the development of the colonies into a connected continental social network. Still, by our standards, communications both domestic and international were painfully slow. In many instances in his long career as a representative of the Pennsylvania Assembly in England, during which time he lived in the Benjamin Franklin House, and as an ambassador of the new United States in France, Franklin was sending information to America that was hopelessly outdated by the time he received a response more than a month later. Facebook's ability to convey information in nanoseconds rather than weeks or months via public or private exchange is obviously an incalculable advantage over Franklin's era. Given all of these natural affinities, community building and the ability to share information widely, quickly and cheaply, it is likely that if he were alive today, Franklin would have an account on Facebook. He might even have violated Facebook's rules and maintained dozens under the more than 42 pseudonyms he used to share his thoughts anonymously during his career, starting with Mrs. Silence Do Good. Judging by the common themes of the voluminous material he wrote, printed and distributed, in both private letters and formal publications, Franklin today would share scientific discoveries, his thoughts on politics, would he attacks on overzealous clerics and politicians, and advice on matters personal and professional. In keeping with his rhetorical style, Franklin's posts and replies would be playful and efficient, thoughtful, provocative, irreverent, and often profound. 
Writing under his own name, Franklin also would take care not to overshare or overreact, in keeping with the virtues he tried to model in his public life. According to his autobiography, written between 1771 and 1790, Franklin during his late teen years was unrestrained, which included fathering a child out of wedlock. In 1726, around the time he decided to return to Philadelphia and marry, he determined to master his baser instincts and created a plan for doing so that listed 13 virtues to which he aspired. Temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. Sharing personal details of his everyday activities would have violated number two. Silence, speak not but what may benefit others or yourself, avoid trifling conversation. Branding the content posted by others with hearts and angry signs might have violated number nine, moderation, avoid extremes, forbear resenting injuries so much as you think they deserve. And posting notices of his many accolades would have violated number 13, humility, imitate Jesus and Socrates. Although with proper guardrails, Franklin likely would have seen Facebook as a useful communications tool, he also was an insatiable editorialist with a philosophical bent. I am confident that Franklin would have thought deeply about the many contentious Facebook controversies and scandals that have raged across the globe in the past decade since it evolved into the transformative behemoth it is today. Up until 2012, Facebook weathered a variety of complaints as it tried out new features many of which were designed to increase its desirability to advertisers. For example, in its early years, an individual's newsfeed began to include sponsored ads or stories based on a user's interaction with a business on the site. Complaints regarding violations of privacy like this were handled with opt-out provisions that largely called criticism. This sensible policy of placating customers at little cost surely would have appealed to Franklin, who was always alert to the demands of the marketplace. 2012 brought a new era of controversy and complaints that were far less easy to resolve. At its initial public offering in that year, Facebook was valued at $104 billion. At the time, the network had more than 1 billion monthly active users and 140 billion friend connections. Now, Zuckerberg needed to generate proportionate income to appease shareholders who collectively bet on evaluation far outstripping Facebook's actual profitability. To that end, Facebook began collecting and selling vastly more data in a bid to lure advertisers. In 2011, the Federal Trade Commission had fined the company for breaching its promise to withhold personal data from third-party apps. Nonetheless, Facebook continued encouraging app developers to build products using its data, and questions have been raised about the company's ability to protect user data, even if it wanted to, which it almost certainly did not. For example, in 2014, a Cambridge psychology professor named Alexander Kogan founded a company called Global Science Research that created a personality test called This Is Your Digital Life. Nearly 300,000 Facebook users signed a consent form and received compensation to take the test. However, the quiz also was surreptitiously shared with millions of the research subjects' friends as well. These individuals had no idea that their responses and their personal data were being harvested. Cambridge Analytica, a British consulting firm co-founded by Americans Robert Mercer and Steve Bannon, ultimately used this data collected from more than 50 million Facebook users to create psychographic profiles of voters in specific locations. Their objectives were to manipulate voter preferences in the Brexit vote and US presidential elections in 2016 by using the data to micro-target advertisements playing on their fears and prejudices. When the news of this data harvesting project surfaced in 2018, Zuckerberg apologized and began efforts to adopt the European Union's more stringent general data protection regulations, even in regions outside the EU. What would Franklin have thought of this scandal? Benjamin Franklin most likely would have been fascinated by the technological and quantitative aspects of the data aggregated by Kogan and Cambridge Analytica. In 1751, he used information including records of births, marriages, and deaths to predict increase of mankind in Europe as compared with the North American colonies. As an astute businessman, he also would have understood the value of knowing which audiences would be likely customers for his publications. And as a Pennsylvania assemblyman and continental congressman, he would have marveled at the ability to sway votes so efficiently. However, Facebook's privacy problems probably also would have reminded him of the spying that took place in his own era, which he heartily opposed. As a colonial postmaster, Franklin made his employees swear not to open any mail, a common practice among postmasters who were also printers and eager, eager for news to publish. 
During the revolutionary era, it was common for statesmen like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and others to write in code to avoid the common problem of spying. On the basis of Franklin's distaste for surveillance alone, he almost certainly would have joined the ranks of those outraged by the harvesting of Facebook's data. But his outrage also would have extended to the idea that the personal details of his own life could be excavated and disseminated. As Gordon Wood writes, Franklin was a man of many masks whose conversation was marked by calculated restraint and reserved character. Franklin additionally would have seen Cambridge Analytica's actions as a form of deceit, violating his seventh virtue. For Franklin, deceit was the opposite of sincerity. In making only an insincere effort to protect user data, Facebook thereby became complicit in Cambridge Analytica's nefarious scheme. Finally, and most importantly, Franklin would have absolutely condemned the uses to which the consulting firm put the data it amassed. Christopher Wiley, a contractor with Cambridge Analytica and later its most prominent whistleblower, admitted that their purpose had been to fight a culture war in America. The company was supposed to be the arsenal of weapons to fight that culture war. It, it literally is impossible to think of a goal more anathema to Franklin's main objective throughout his life as a community organizer and public servant to join together Americans at home and abroad. Franklin's desire to foster unity amongst rivals perhaps is most evident in his peerless diplomacy to facilitate ratification of the U.S. Constitution. I just have this lovely quote from the Library of Congress exhibit from his speech to Congress in 1787. Uh, For we are sent hither to consult, not contend with each other, and declaration of a fixed opinion and of determined resolutions never to change it, neither enlighten nor convince us. As a master of collective action, Franklin urged convention attendees to stand together, as more Michael Werner writes, to act as authors and promoters of the whole document. Notwithstanding the Constitution's lamentable failure to eradicate slavery and grant full citizenship to women, this still was a supreme accomplishment, the culmination of efforts Franklin and others had been engaged in for decades to knit together Americans, America's colonies into a singular entity, now a United States. Franklin might have reminded Zuckerberg of the better angels of his original very simple Facebook goal to bring people together. Any use of the platform to segment and polarize rather than unite would clearly fall afoul of Franklin's overriding philosophy of networking as a means of building communal comedy, prosperity, and virtue. In addition to privacy concerns, Franklin also would have had a great deal to say about the very thorny matter of what today is politely called content moderation, but really is, more bluntly speaking, censorship. Today, Facebook removes or demotes an enormous volume of speech for reasons it specifies, including violence and criminal behavior, safety, objectionable content, integrity and authenticity, and respecting intellectual property. These categories have evolved and vastly expanded over time. When Facebook first was launched, utopian, mostly American idealists, believed that the internet could and should be an almost entirely unregulated marketplace of ideas. This was the early idealism behind the open internet, a commonly accessible network which would unleash creativity and exchange in unprecedented volume. Free expression was assumed as a norm and in keeping with the spirit of the First Amendment, Mark Zuckerberg envisioned that Facebook would be an unobstructed conduit for people to share content of their own choosing. American law ratified this vision, if not its execution. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996 states, that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another content provider. This provision both reflected a nation imbued with the spirit of free speech and also enabled the United States to become the social media center of the world. As companies including Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, and Reddit found safe legal harbor from any misconduct by their users. Nearly everywhere else in the world, social media companies could be, and sometimes are, held liable for harm arising from content on their sites. Legal scholar David Post credits this provision with driving a trillion dollars of value to American companies. Adopting the ethos of the First Amendment, Section 230 promised that in America, neither Congress, state legislatures, nor the executive branch would censor the internet. This feature of American law and Facebook can trace its ancestry directly to Benjamin Franklin and the culture of freedom of the press began to loudly assert in mid 18th century Philadelphia. Franklin both experienced censorship and practiced the routine tasks of deciding what to print and publish and what to avoid during most of his career. His familiarity with both sides of the equation began at an early age. 
1722, Massachusetts governors jailed James Franklin and forbade him from printing his newspaper, the New England Current, on the basis of an editorial barb suggesting that the administration had been lax in pursuing pirates. Censorship of the press was entirely allowable for governors under English law, as all publications technically operated with permission from the crown. To get around the restriction, James nominally put his younger brother in charge of the current, and Benjamin's career as a publisher thus began in an act of rebellious subterfuge. Benjamin's own indiscreet about disputations about religion soon got him into hot water as well, hastening his flight from Boston. Censorship and evading it was part of Franklin's life literally from his childhood. Nearly a decade later, Franklin experienced his most difficult encounter with proposed censorship, this time from an angry mob. In 1731, his Philadelphia shop printed a circular for a sea captain who mockingly referred to local clergy as black gowns and declared them just as unwelcome on his ship as sea hands, a widely known euphemism for prostitutes. The sea captain promptly sailed off before public outrage erupted with the result that all of it was directed at Franklin, including loud calls for a boycott of his shop. In response, Franklin published a defensive apology on the front page of his Gazette, asserting in part, the printers were not responsible for the content they produced on behalf of clients. In essence, he declared his own Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act. In a statement titled, Apology for Printers, he irreverently responded to the outrage. Being frequently censured and condemned by different persons for printing things which they say ought not to be printed, I have sometimes thought it might be necessary to make a standing apology for myself and publish it once a year to be read on all occasions of that nature, he continued. The peculiar unhappiness of printing as a profession is that scarcely anything can be published which shall not give offense to some and perhaps to many. It is unreasonable to imagine printers approve of everything they print and to censure them on any particular thing accordingly, since, since in the way of their business they print such a great variety of things, opposite and contradictory. It is likewise as unreasonable what some assert that printers ought not to print anything but what they approve, since if all of that business should make such a resolution and abide by it, an end would thereby be put to free writing, and the world would afterwards have nothing to read but what happened to be the opinions of printers. Franklin's impassioned non-apology apology has been quoted on numerous occasions as the creed core of a free American press. Perhaps less quoted is the second half of Franklin's apology, which he explains the enormous amount of care Franklin took in deciding what not to publish, that the public would never see and therefore give him credit for averting. The shift in tone is the result of his pragmatism, which always tempered his libertarianism. The protesters were also Franklin's customers and not just his neighbors. As a printer, he had to balance free expression, liability and profits. He continued, Printers do continually discourage the printing of great numbers of bad things and stifle them in the birth. I myself have constantly refused to print anything that might countenance vice or promote immorality, though by complying in such cases with the corrupt taste of the majority, I might have got much money. I have also refused to print such things as might do real injury to any person, how much soever I have been solicited and tempted with offers of great pay, and how much soever I have by refusing got the ill will of those who would have employed me. I have there heretofore fallen under the resentment of large bodies of men for refusing absolutely to print any of their party or personal reflections. In this manner, I have made myself many enemies and the constant fatigue of denying is almost insupportable. Mark Zuckerberg and his public relations staff likely would recognize and share Franklin's sense of frustration. Facebook today calls an unprecedented volume of speech and images from its site and for its efforts is equally condemned by those whose content is removed and by those who think more should be taken down. The stakes are enormously high in these decisions. As law professor Jeffrey Rosen wrote in 2010, social media moderators have more power in determining who can speak and who can be heard around the globe than any Supreme Court justice, any king or any president. And that was years before Facebook began its campaign of full-throated content moderation. Section 230 or no, both Franklin and Facebook should be seen as not merely printers of the ideas of others, but also as publishers asserting editorial control. Franklin made clear that he did so often. Facebook was loath to admit this role at the outset, but the slippery slope descending to its current position as the world's most prolific censor began early on. Despite its initial plan to allow expression to pour forth unfiltered, within short order, people were posting terrifying text and images. Facebook needed to maintain sight that users were not afraid to access, and thus some policing was unavoidable. 
In 2008, Facebook formed a small hate and harassment team, which removed material that violated the terms of service would prohibit material that is hateful, threatening, pornographic, or incites violent or illegal acts. A list which sounds similar to Franklin's own prohibit, a prohibition against vice, immorality, and harm. For several years, Facebook resisted expanding its restrictions, hoping to maintain its conceptual privilege as a mere printer, essentially free of liability. But horrifying content continued to be posted, making this position increasingly untenable. This problem reached a critical juncture in 2019. For 29 minutes, thousands of Facebook users watched a live streamed massacre of Muslim worshipers in Christchurch, New Zealand. The idea that Facebook could be a largely unobstructed conduit of user-generated content an idea that steadily had been eroding, now vanished. Today, tens of thousands and possibly more than 100,000 content moderators speaking dozens of languages around the world review flagged content and remove posts and accounts as rapidly as possible. The company also is pouring money into the expansion of artificial intelligence programs that perform many of the same functions. Facebook further has hired fact-checking firms to advise it of clear misinformation which should be re removed entirely or demoted by algorithms which determine how often or how widely a post is seen, although it is unclear to what extent the company abides by their suggestions. Benjamin Franklin would no doubt be horrified, but not necessarily surprised by the human violence, depravity, and meanness shared on Facebook. He lived in a time of cruel colonization tactics, genocide, slavery, plague, famine, and brutal warfare. Since the origin story of the American press, which dates back to Franklin's era, these difficult conditions have always existed. Neither Franklin, Mark Zuckerberg, nor any other credible communications professional would ever suggest that there is nothing worthy of censure and censorship. But the daily work of drawing a boundary line between printable and unprintable speech also involves surveying a vast train of materials much less easy to distinguish. As Franklin wrote in his apology, so many men, so many minds, adding, all this is very hard, with an exclamation mark. Two irresolvable problems persist, from Franklin's time to our own, which we must admit and acknowledge. The first is that there is evil in the world and plenty of people who want their voices to be heard for reprehensible purposes. Some censorship is necessary in any society to promote the common good and to minimize harm of many kinds. The question is who should be the arbiter? Franklin was very clear on this point. In 1737, an essay was published in the Pennsylvania Gazette, presumably by Franklin himself, on freedom of speech in the press. He admitted that there were abuses of the freedom of speech that amounted to excesses of liberty they ought to be repressed, and then asked, but to whom dare we commit the care of doing it? An evil magistrate entrusted with power to punish for words would be armed with a weapon the most destructive and terrible. Under pretense of pruning off the exuberant branches, he would be apt to destroy the tree. In other words, Franklin wasn't opposed to all censorship. He simply trusted printers rather than politicians to make the difficult call between allowable and immoral speech. Before we accept his position, we should consider that this too must be acknowledged as an imperfect proposition. Who is so virtuous as to be able to draw the boundaries of speech with wisdom and equanimity in all cases? Take the case of Benjamin, himself, for Benjamin Franklin himself, for example. Franklin came to the cause of abolition only very late in his life, although fervently at that time. His last public act, two months before his death in 1790, was to submit a petition to Congress advocating an end to legal slavery. But for most of his working life, Franklin held several African Americans in bondage, both in Philadelphia and in London, including a couple named Peter and Jemima, their son Othello, and John, a young man who accompanied Franklin on overseas journeys. David Waldstreicher underscores that American printing, like much of the colonial economy, was established by slaves and servants, the labor of the unfree. <clears throat> Even though Franklin himself started life as an indentured apprentice, beaten by his brother with legal impunity, fully one quarter of his own Philadelphia Gazette editions contained ads fostering the slave trade. The choice not to censor in this Regis case is a good reminder that these types of decisions often have as much to do with economics as they do with morality. Franklin chose to print the ads and accept the revenue while also taking payment from Quakers to print their abolitionist circulars. Just in the, as in the case of the black gowns and sea hens, he might have claimed that he wasn't really paying attention to either. But the responsibility ultimately rested on his shoulders as it does in the case of Mark Zuckerberg, whether he wants to admit it or not. Both then and now printers were engaged in a constant exercise of balancing competing forces, 
the potential for outrage, their moral duty, and the desirability of profits. How sad then in retrospect that the slight to clerics caused so much outrage and potential for financial losses in the advertisement for the sale of human beings held in bondage. Recently, Mark Zuckerberg's chief rival, Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey, made a transformational decision to begin removing tweets containing dangerous misinformation about COVID-19, including those from the accounts of prominent politicians, such as Jair Bolsonaro, president of Brazil, and Nicolas Maduro, president of Venezuela. And just this week, Twitter applied a fact check label to a tweet shared by President Donald Trump, who claims that mail-in ballots are fraudulent. The president's assertion, which defies research and evidence, is considered dangerous not only because in-person voting may spread the COVID-19 virus, but also because the allegation of fraud might be used as a pretext for defying election results in November that are adverse to the president and his Republican party. The fact check label directs users to articles about mail-in ballots in mainstream news sources. This move is significant because this is the first time Twitter has chosen to label a Trump tweet, despite years of complaint over his circulation of conspiracy theories, bullying language, racist and sexist taunts, and even medical recommendations that can lead to unnecessary suffering and death. Facebook, in contrast, chose not to follow Twitter's lead when Trump posted the same content on its site, stating, quote, we believe that people should be able to have a robust debate about the electoral process, which is why we have crafted our policies to focus on misrepresentations that would interfere with the vote. Facebook will take down lies about how to order a ballot, for example, but not lies about a candidate or lies by a candidate. If the source is what it calls authentic, meaning a real person connected to a real name, Facebook assumes that the users can make their own assessment of the likely value and veracity of the information. So, for example, if Donald Trump recommends drinking bleach, Facebook leaves the post intact and assumes readers won't listen to him. Who would Franklin side with, Dorsey or Zuckerberg? The young Franklin who wrote Apology of a Printer might well have sided with Mark Zuckerberg. When truth and error have fair play, he wrote, the former is always an overmatch for the latter. But Franklin would have been vexed to have his inauthentic pseudonymous accounts removed, and we would have lost a great deal of wisdom if he had not been able to use anonymity to put forth provocative criticisms. Franklin, therefore, might have advised Zuckerberg to focus on the nature of the content rather than its authenticity. He also likely would have worried about Facebook's business model as an inducement to poor decisions in contrast to Twitter. In November 2019, Twitter banned all paid political advertising on its site. In reality, the platform still serves as a major vehicle for candidates to promote their campaigns, but still the profit motive to, to accept harmful content is far reduced. Facebook, in comparison, expects to earn about $400 million in 2020 from its sale of political advertising. It's not surprising, therefore, that last year, Facebook made the controversial decision to exempt political ads from fact-checking protocols it applies to other sources of information and to continue allowing the micro-targeting and therefore the polarization of voters. On this score, Franklin very likely would part ways with Louis Zuckerberg and specifically Facebook's business model. Rather than forming a monopolistic corporation during his own career, which he easily could have done, Franklin innovated a business model much closer to franchising. He trained and financed young printers whom he admired and respected in other colonial towns, who thereafter remunerated him with a share of their profits. At the height of his career, Ralph Rasco writes, Franklin established a network of associates that included eight out of the 15 newspapers in North America and the West Indies. These printers exchanged their newspapers and reprinted each other's stories, extending their reach much in the same way an item shared over and over on Facebook equally increases its influence. Franklin never attempted to control the editorial content shared within this network, however. In contrast, in 2018, Monica Bickert, head of global policy management for Facebook, described the goals of its content moderation guidelines as follows. We try to make sure that our standards are sufficiently granular so that they don't leave a lot of room for interpretation. Reviewers are going to have different ideas about what level of nudity is offensive or what level of graphic violence is something we should take down. Or should you be able to use certain words? What constitutes an ethnic slur? We have very specific guidance. So if the person is in the Philippines and in India in Texas, as they are going to reach the same decision. Franklin likely would have viewed this ideal of unitary authority to shape speech as enormously dangerous in comparison to a network of individuals making a variety of independent decisions rooted in the values of their local communities. Franklin spent his life bringing people together, but never for the purpose of groupthink. 
As Walter Isaacson writes, Franklin's most fundamental ideal was a faith in the wisdom of the common citizen that was manifest in appreciation for democracy and opposition to all forms of tyranny. And he not only espoused that view, he actively worked to make it true, founding and supporting educational institutions and an exchange of ideas that would build the wisdom necessary for people entrusted with the highest power in government. Facebook's playbook for regulating the speech of over 2.6 billion users likely would strike Franklin as a dangerous opportunity for tyranny, particularly in light of the fact that the profit motive so strongly favors the speech of wealthy customers rather than citizens. In a final thought experiment, I would like to imagine what Benjamin Franklin would advise Mark Zuckerberg to do now at the age of 36. And I can sum that up in one word, retire. In 1748, at the age of 42, Benjamin Franklin signed a co-partnership agreement with his foreman, David Hall, and retired from business. Next, Franklin moved on to the life he dreamed of as a scientist, philanthropist, and statesman. In 1750, Franklin explained his choice by asserting that he wanted to be remembered for living usefully rather than dying rich. 20 years later, Franklin bemoaned the single-minded pursuit of profit. The sight of so many rich wallowing in superfluous plenty, whereby so many are kept poor, distressed by want. Franklin's fervor for personal industry was never for the trappings of wealth that hard work might bring, but rather for the comfort provided to those who contributed hard work and honest dealings to civil society. As my final thought of what Franklin would advise Mark Zuckerberg, I suggest that he would have tactfully coaxed him to dismember Facebook for the greater good, perhaps into multiple autonomous franchises led by trusted and thoughtful leaders like the printers Franklin trained and established. Franklin would remind Zuckerberg that tyranny can be the product of an overly powerful company as well as a king or president. With power shared more broadly, so too would the potential for conversations likely to produce new knowledge, ideas, and yes, wealth. Franklin knew that we cannot wish away the difficult responsibility to adjudicate the balance between freedom of speech and the health of the nation. In his world, many more individuals shared that burden. Why not in ours? Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. That was fascinating and very timely um, with yes. uh, <laughs> uh, all the fact checking. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, we have time for some questions. So um, for the people, the attendees who are tuning in, you have two ways to ask questions. You can either write in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, or if you would prefer to raise your hand, I can call on you and you can actually ask the question live. Um, so we actually already have a question in the Q&A section. Um, from Michael Lobel. Uh, he said, Amy, extending the proposition behind your talk to your other scholarly work, what do you think Anthony Comstock would think about Facebook? Not so much its content, but rather its efforts to put content moderation and oversight into effect. Thank you, Michael. Yes, yeah, so my, uh, my most recent book is um, Lust on Trial, Censorship and the Rise of American Obscenity in the Age of Anthony Comstock. So I wrote about censorship really at its height. And actually, uh, Comstock was a postal agent, so he's kind of in this direct line of descent from Franklin, but he really was a, absolutely uh, an oppositional figure to Benjamin Franklin. Um, he was not a libertarian in any sense, and, and Franklin would have, you know, loved for Facebook. He, he would have been so excited for all the algorithms that can scrub every possible, you know, breast or every, or maybe even take out anybody wearing any uh, garment that showed their skin whatsoever. So I think, um, his position was really very extreme. He never worried about freedom of speech or expression. Um, he was a really devout evangelical who wanted to kind of purge sin from the United States. And I actually um, would say they're kind of like opposite uh, uh, figures in American history, but thank you for the question. So we have another question from Dan Levinson Wilk, who asks, Franklin and Zuckerberg were slash are both inventors engineers. Do engineers have a particular perspective on free speech and censorship? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think that, you know, um, Franklin actually, you know, he had developed this new type of lightning rod and, and there were like political machinations in having his research suppressed, um, you know, at the, uh, Royal Academy of Sciences in London. And, um, you know, I think that for anybody who's an inventor, engineer, they, they want to be able to have access to as much information as possible and access to 
you know, being able to present their information. You know, one thing that, that just strikes me in that when I was teaching in China um, on my first Fulbright in 2011, 2012, the internet was so slow because of censorship. It's probably even slower now. Um, and you couldn't download research and information. And so uh, it was very hard, like any topic that you wanted, just because everything was sort of going through these pipelines. And so I think to the extent that anybody involved in, um, in research needs access to information that that censorship you know slows things down and it may prevent your ability to access something really important um, to your work so i think that um that spirit of always wanting to see everything to know more is would definitely mark both of them and um and and definitely would have you know had them err on the side of more free speech rather than less thank you dan so we also have an anonymous attendee who's asking a question. <laughs> um, and they ask, um, you said that Franklin harbored resentment of, of Harvard. Uh, what would he have made of the trend in US political discourse to undermine and disparage experts, especially those with elite educational backgrounds? Oh yeah, this would be a big no-no for Franklin. Every, everywhere he traveled, and, and he traveled you know, all over Europe, he would seek out the most famous scholars and intellectuals and philosophers and scientists and um you know those were the people whose ear you wanted to bend and to learn from them and uh that was definitely a huge part of his network was to really emphasize networks of expertise and so i think and actually one thing that occurred to me that i didn't quite work into the talk was there's this new phrase vice signaling that you know politicians sort of uh, you know, make themselves look stronger and more powerful or whatever by showing like what bad boys they are. And Franklin was also the opposite of that. Franklin, you know, the, the term virtue signaling now kind of suggests that people don't really mean it. But, and, and Franklin was very honest that he had a hard time living up to his dream of being perfectly virtuous. So, you know, he, he says, right, you know, right out front, like he never really managed it. But he, want, he thought the role models should model virtue and and one of the great virtues was to respect knowledge and to seek out knowledge and to um be able to discern truth and so i think that this would be just he, he would be horrified by the uh, devaluation of education and expertise by certain politicians and especially because as benjamin franklin as a man with only two years of formalized education um you know, I'm sure that he he put a lot of value in. Yes. You know, <laughs> uh, as and you mentioned. founded the University of Pennsylvania and you know libraries and you know I mean it, it, his life was devoted to uh, education and I think that's something that um, if Mark Zuckerberg does retire, that's what he should devote the rest of his life to promoting uh, education, especially um, you know civics education and communications education, like critical thinking. Um, these are the skills that Franklin knew were necessary for people who had the power in their own vote in particular. So we have time for, um, thank you very much for that, Amy. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and we have uh, Emily Stone asks, uh, we're losing so much local news right now and Facebook has played a role in that. What advice might Franklin have for Facebook about how to write our course? Um, well, as I said at the end of my talk, I really think that um, Franklin would see that a better model for the dissemination of news would involve basically breaking up Facebook, that, that its top-down structure leaves too much speech in the control of too few people. So it's not really a network in that sense, that um, in the sense that the printing networks that he set up had these different satellites rooted in local journalism. And I think that's really important too. And a big part of the demise of local journalism is that people read news on Facebook and don't necessarily, or, or clearly don't subscribe as often to their local uh, newspapers. Um, people also use Facebook for advertising, apartments and so forth, and that revenue has been sucked away from the support of local journalism. So I think all of those things would be just huge red flags for Franklin, and I think that he would see that this idea that they just keep making more and more rules and hiring more and more content moderators is really not the right, you know, course of action. And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's plenty rich. He doesn't need money anymore, and that when Franklin reached that 
point in his life, he said enough, like money is not the be all and end all. And that, um, you know, to really do something good for the future of um, his country, this country that gave him so much, um, that free speech is a, um, is a, an extraordinary privilege that Americans have, but it also comes with a lot of obligations. And I think that Franklin would urge Mark Zuckerberg to be a more responsible um, citizen of the United States. Very well said. Thank you very much, Amy, for taking the time to do this presentation. Um, we're sad that you, you weren't able to come to Benjamin Franklin House to do it, um, but we're glad that we have this technology to bring us together, even though we're all we're all staying at home. So um, I hope that everybody who's tuning in is staying safe. Uh, and we hope to see you at Benjamin Franklin uh, very soon, Benjamin Franklin House very soon. And uh, thank you again, Amy. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Bye. Bye.